So, just to give you a little bit of uh, an understanding of Wentworth Engage, as Kerry said, it's uh, the activity which we've just begun with the Wentworth Institute to connect our students to the wider community, to encourage them to think of ways in which they can contribute to the common good by uh, voluntary service or other forms of service with organisations both for-profit and not-for-profit, and to, I suppose, open our students up to perhaps a wider world than the one they've, they're currently familiar with, noting that so many of our students are already very engaged in their communities. Those students that come from other um, communities overseas are often very, very community-minded within their own communities, which is a fabulous thing to see. But it would be wonderful to see um, Wentworth itself um, uh, encouraging students to engage in different types of activities. So um, thank you, everyone. Uh, now, I'm going to introduce you all to Sai Paravastu. Sai um, is uh, a, a friend, colleague of our other Sai, <laughs> Lakaraju, from um, one of our lecturers here at the Wentworth Institute. And Sai Paravastu has very kindly agreed to uh, talk to us today about his experience both professionally and within the community. Um, Sai has been engaged in volunteering activities of all sorts for many years, and uh, most notably in his role as a board member of the Hindu Council of Australia, Karma Kitchen, which is a service that provides food to those who do not have enough, and also lots of work in the mental health space as well. Sai runs uh, a technology company, um, Called, what's it called again, Sai? It is um, Bar 360, the founder and uh, director of Bar 360, which will also be very interesting to hear about. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, well, maybe over to you, Sai, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your how you got involved in these activities in the community and the, you know, the benefit that you see for the community at large, of course, and then also for yourself. Thank you. Um, thank you. I feel uh, very privileged to be here in, uh, among you all. Uh, thanks, Wentworth Institute, Sai Lakaraju, for uh, nominating or suggesting my name. Um, my, uh, as Dominic introduced, my name is Sai Paravastu. I migrated to Australia in 1999. Uh, I called myself, I came here as an opportunity or as a problem, a why to get back to fix some of that year 2000 problems. And then I loved living here, liked the country, and I decided to call it a home. <laughs> so I professionally am into data, uh, as Dominic said, and I'm a data junkie, or you could say I'm an open source evangelist. And my venture in the data space is mainly to see how we can um, use the open source technology to solve day-to-day -day business problems and also to weigh, pave that as a foundation for learning. Anybody who wants to learn, how do they, you don't need to go and buy a software or enroll into something to learn. It's about how do you use this capability to uh, solve a business problem. That was the journey and um, yeah, there's more about it. I present in ACS and Dharma, um, in the open source groups about how to leverage and how to learn and all those stuff. We can um, talk about that on another day. <laughs> Today's main uh, uh, reason for my invite was about um, the charitable work which I do and uh, to see what I do and what I feel and how it works, right? So I'm currently uh, Director for Community Services at the Council of Australia. But the journey started way before, uh, back when I was back in India. And a charity is not something I um, separated from what I do, or it's not a separable thing for anyone. Uh, it's a reciprocation. It could, we all are doing it, or sometimes we do it without knowing or unknowingly. We do that. But if we can put that as a culture or, or part of our life, that's where it becomes more uh, meaningful or rewarding, at least for me. It's more rewarding to see 
uh, somebody being either fed or taught or, or uh, given a chance to do something uh, when they are really struggling. That's all it is. It's, it's, there are plenty of sayings. And one of the things which sticks to me is that nobody ever becomes poor by giving. Right? If you're giving something, you're giving it from what you have and what is left with you. Sometimes you might be uh, more generous to give away what you have and you might give your meal to someone and you go hunger. That's a, that's a different extreme. But usually if somebody is parting something they have, they definitely cherish that moment and that, that gives them such a good satisfaction which you don't even get by getting a full salary. That's at least to me. That's how I see it. Right? And um, very early in the when I was growing up, I heard this thing which also stuck in my head, which is um, a, a, a Greek philosopher, Aristotle. You might have heard his name, many of you. Um, he said, man is a social animal. And I was, when, I was, when I read that, it just stuck to me saying, what do you mean by social animal? Like, uh, we, I always thought I'm not an animal. I'm a human, right? When I, when I first time heard that, I thought, okay, I'm also an animal then, right? What is that social animal in this context? Is like, we live in a society and I think um, we are blessed to have this life where we behave, we have some behavioral aspects, we do things more logical and non-destructive way and make a better life than an animal. But end of the day, we have to be in the society. That's what it is, right? And uh, and everyone deserves to be equal, not exactly equal, but at least the basics should be equal, right? The food and shelter and basic amenities should be there. Everyone should have enough clothes and enough to eat. So that was something as well. And then another thing which stuck to my head, I don't know whether I'm giving you a lot of philosophical wordings, but I'm just saying what I, uh, some of the things which struck me and make me motivated to do this work again and again. Once I saw a hoarding which said, there's more fruit in a rich man's shampoo than on a poor man's plate. I could never forget that. That is so true. Like even sometimes I shower, I feel that, yes, I'm using strawberry flavor, whereas people don't even know what strawberry is. Or... <laughs> so these are some of the things which makes you feel that, yeah, it is true that, um, is it my phone buzzing? No, right. Um, so, yeah, those are some of the things which keeps me motivated to say, how can I be more useful to the community and uh, there's more um, need in the community or society. Right? And uh, during this last two years, the, the whole tide or whole needs have changed. The dimension of the need has changed. It's not just food and uh, shelter. It's, um, it's about the well-being, which is also... Uh, I think it will take a lot of time for people to come out of the state of mind they were or the depressions they're going through or the struggle they're struggling internally. They don't even have someone to share. So a lot of people who are living single or, or being single would be going even more difficult, right? Families are at least together in their, uh, within the family, but others are hard. And um, it's very hard to be connected and keep yourself motivated at all. So um, yeah, these are some of the things I thought, um, I didn't prepare any presentation or anything as such. I thought I'll just go with the flow to see, uh, I want to keep it interactive. If you wanted to ask some questions as well, but I'll make some statements and see how it goes. Yeah. So I always kind of ask you, um, over the COVID period, um, we at the Wentworth Institute have been very, very conscious of a, a number of our, oh, many of our students going through great difficulty, particularly those of Nepalese background or Indian background, mm -hmm. with the, you know, the pretty tough things that were going on back home in India. Yeah. Have you experienced the same thing uh, with a lot of the people that you work with here in Sydney or elsewhere? Yeah. That's, that's actually true. Like uh, a lot of um, migrant community, uh, Indians, Bangladeshis, Nepalis, we've helped these students in the first phase of COVID, I would say, 
um, because they were both like they were struggling in terms of um, financial means by losing jobs and whatnot, uh, not able to pay rents and stuff. But uh, on the other hand, they were also mentally challenged because back home, their loved ones are going through some tough time. They neither can't go, can go there and help them or they could survive here. Some of the people were even reluctant to take help because they feel that they're well and they're physically good. And they should be working for their entitlements, not get a charity, right? So it was it was a bit difficult um, for these kids. And full praise to them that uh, they stayed. Uh, some of them, most of them, took the help they could, and they stayed home and stayed safe. And some of them made their travels back home. Um, yeah, it, this was difficult for students. Not only, yeah, thankfully universities and colleges were not charging them, but they still had to come up with their. Um, rental and food and all, which is difficult. And I imagine some of them were actually supporting their families back home. That's quite common, I'd imagine, sending money back home. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Uh, For these, some of them, like, um, with that, with the money they make, uh, they barely survive. They just share, uh, they live in shared accommodation, eat to the limited portions. And if they can't fork out some money back home for their younger ones' educations or their families' expenses, they do that, yeah. They, they are real strugglers and they are real hard workers of the community and um, they stir up so much of economy. They keep the economy alive as well. They do all these baristas, they do all this uh, work which we don't do. <laughs> so, I, I, I joke with the Nepalese students, I said, Nepal feeds Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly feeds inner city Sydney. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, anyone else? Does anyone have any questions for Sai? I would, um, do you mind? Uh, I'd, yes. I'd be very interested, Sai, if you think that there is a potential for uh, firming up a linkage between students volunteering and, you know, maybe moving it on from something that is just casual. So just to give you an example, I mean, I, I used to have a friend who ran volunteering New South Wales. And when Mari was in that job, I had a, and at that time I was at UTS, I actually had a process going where students would actually build into a program and do something. Because one of the things that I observed was that students would, get the idea that they wanted to do something, but it actually wasn't always really easy for them to find some concrete way to do it. And I'm wondering really if you could give us any advice about how we might facilitate that happening in some way. That's a very um, a good question, actually, Gary. That's a, it's such an important one, to be honest. Like um, uh, in the student life, I know, so for international students, it's part of their, big part of their studying here is also working. But in a student's life, I see that they're learning and they wanted to apply their skills when they complete their studies, right? Part of the program, they do some internships at the end of the course or something like that. Most of it is study. But volunteering is also very useful for them in shaping their career. Sometimes volunteering, we always look for, I always encourage students to come forward for that. They can be our MCs for the program, right? They're dynamic, they're young, they can do that. They can be a cultural um, uh, volunteers. They can perform something, sing or dance or music. They can be a volunteer for doing digital marketing these days, digital, which they can learn that skill. They can be a volunteer in physically putting up events and managing the event. That's a big skill. Like you can learn so much of event management, which helps you in becoming a project manager or something to work in a real enterprise. Volunteering is difficult. I wouldn't say that it's, it's, it's an as easy as individually, yes, you can go and stand with someone for a cause, but if you're working for a vol volunteering for an organization, you'll pick up a lot of skills, a lot of things you can learn. You work with big people and seniors, like retired people, you get all, all kind of mix of people. A lot of people who are of my, 
uh, age group who are working or running businesses, they don't have full time to work, right? They can mentor these volunteers to um, in the directions they want to grow. And that could, that could sometimes open them networking opportunities to meet people and get their careers shaped up as well. So absolutely. I, I, I think that it's, um, I think we've found it a little bit difficult though, and other people might have a view about this. It, it has struck me that a lot of our students have been so busy surviving, sure. just working, getting enough money to be able to live, that um, they may not appreciate the role of volunteerism as much as they should. Dominic, does that conform to your experience? It, it does, um, Kerry. I, 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 my sense is the students are so busy surviving that they, so during COVID particularly, but even I think before COVID, they're busy surviving. They're juggling work, uh, studies, um, sending money back home or whatever. So they've got um, you know, so many commitments already and they're already connected with their own community. So I think we have a, even more of a challenge in that regard. But maybe I thought, maybe Aj Ajay Sandhu, who's the president of the Wentworth Institute Students Association, is here with us now. Ajay, do you have a view on this as to how, you know, uh, students and getting involved in community activities as volunteers? Is that what yeah, is like we, we would love to, you know, volunteer um, if we have time. But the thing is, like, before, uh, like, as you said, before COVID, um, we were working, like, students were working, like, physically hard, you know, working two or three shifts and then going to college, you know, traveling. But now it's just more mentally, like, um, every time we go in the lockdown, this is, you know, our rooms are Australia, like we can't go out. Mm. So our classes are, you know, everything is here. Um, voluntarily in work is just something that um, hard for us. Not, it's not an, an, a simple option um, because we are not here just to, just to study. We are here to explore. You, we get to, you know, experience and all kinds of stuff. Interesting. Well, uh, Sai, what, what do you think? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I do understand that, yes, it is, uh, it is a pressure point for them to pay their fees and pay their expenses and then see. But uh, the, the habit of keeping that while you're there, even if you're contributing one or two hours into volunteer, volunteering, structure and discipline is more important. It's not volunteering means you stand since morning till evening mm -hmm. and trying to say that I'm here. Right, it's it's about the usefulness. And the other thing I see in in Sanskrit, they say that uh, um, a charity can be done in three ways. Right. Uh, the Sorry, no, charity. So we I missed that. A charity yeah. is done in three ways. Ah. Right. Tan man and tan tan uh, physically, mentally, and monetarily. Right. Sometimes you might not be physically there, but you can still volunteer. These days, a lot of people do that. Like um, digital digitally presenting things, being a uh, co-host for Zoom meetings. I've done so many of them, right? A lot of people struggle to use technology. I said, okay, I'll be there for you one hour. I don't know what they're talking about, but I just manage their thing, running the slides and uh, doing this. And they appreciate that. Like they're, they're able to communicate on coming onto your platform. It's one hour of my time, right? So there are a number of things. You could probably help someone, uh, probably talk to someone for 20 minutes. Um, provide that one hour where we can talk to three people and that's a good help for someone to talking to someone and just uh, it helps in that mental health kind of uh, area right so um, yeah a small portion of it goes a long way and everyone putting a drop makes it a ocean right so if you all say that oh we don't have time we'll get to it when we are done you are never going to be done. <laughs> That's my opinion. Don't take me wrong. I'm just Imagine, uh, putting that. Yeah. I'm a busy person and I think I will die busy. So uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know what not busy is like, really. So, yeah, I think you're right. Um, maybe taking what everyone's been saying, maybe we need to find some really flexible options for our students that are not overly demanding as regards time but are beneficial to them and also to the community. So that um, uh, yes, they can do things and contribute, but not spend hours doing it. 
Yeah. yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe being an international student is 101 is survival, 201 is volunteering. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe, yes. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Can, I, can I add something as a... Um, someone who's been involved a lot with the BIM students, the interactive media students, um, as, with a background in design, the way I broke into the industry as a young designer was volunteering. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, that's very normal in that field because there are a large number of people who want the work and um, managing to get a few pieces of work in my portfolio as a young designer that I wasn't paid for. Um, I worked for... NGOs, charities to to produce um, marketing material for them. And that actually led to some wonderful opportunities that were paid in the end. So I do encourage all of the the Bachelor of Interactive Media students to grab any chance you can to design that business card for your brother-in-law or whatever it is, (laughs) you know, put up a simple website for someone put it in your portfolio and you never know where that might lead later on. You're helping someone else and you're also helping yourself. I'm wondering whether Cindy would like to say a word, Dominic. Yes. Cindy? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm very impressed. You know, Dominic organizes windows engagement. It's a very good practice. And also, like, uh, thanks all our team, you know, participants in this program especially the, the side from external come join us. Thank you, Sai. <laughs> and I heard the Sai did that, that charity work actually, I really think very significant for community. You know, another day I watched the TV, um, even more about how long people queue for Food Bank, it's called, that charity, you know. I oh, think food, food Bank, yeah. Yeah, yeah Food Bank, yeah. Food. I think son did something like that charity yeah it, it's provide very great help for the international student it, you know in this difficult time they, they do need the, the the people like you you know provide help to them you did a lot very good work for for the people who need help you know in the community and also, I think our international students do need this opportunity, you know, because I heard some Chinese students, you know, stay in three or four years in Australia, and then when they back to China, they even don't know the, the Australian society because they don't have opportunity to involve all those social activity, you know. Absolutely. If we provide opportunity to them, it's very good. Otherwise, but you know, they, they are living in Australia a few years, but they, they don't know anything about that. So I, I think Dominic, very good if we provide our students as volunteer work, ask them participate in all the social work, you know, like um, clean, clean up Australian day. Remember that's one day. Yeah, if we can ask our students to join those sort of activity, you know, give them very good um, portfolio for the background. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great idea. Clean up Australia, yeah. those 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 campaigns that are national across Australia. Yeah, that's a great idea, actually. I, I've yeah, just okay. had a, I just had a brilliant idea, Dominic. We could yes. do a Clean Up Australia Day in the seat of Coogee with yes. a barbecue at the beach at the end of the day, sponsored by you, Cindy. Absolutely. <laughs> Fabulous idea. Also, yeah, I could do yeah. something for that, yeah. Yeah, that'd be a great idea. That would be very no. good. Yeah. Or no, even clean up my that. house. Clean up let's, Dominic's let's, house. Let's day. do that. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, the tradition that. I have for you guys. I thought I'll bring this up at the end if anybody asks this question. Was uh, You could also form a team to do blood donation, right? That only takes an hour of a day for anyone, if you're, if you're, even if you're busy. It helps so many people, right? If you do a plasma donation, you know, every plasma yeah. donation helps in so much of community, right? So blood donation is another one which you can do as a team and you you can add it to the students. It's not too onerous on their own time, but it's such a such a good social cause. And we could have a lunch afterwards or something. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It is- Within um, the Indian and Nepalese community side, do you, yeah. is blood donation a big thing? Is it a... Yeah, back home I used to do, I started 
detonation very early in my age, uh, young age, but yeah, it's quite common. Like um, blood is something scarce everywhere, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And human produces every every week our blood changes. Even if you don't donate it, it gets yeah. thrown away and new cells are generated in our body. So it's might as well put it for a good cause and mm. donate it. Now, I, I'm getting the, the, the gist, the, the idea here that we need to do things that are communal. So students together doing something That's right. and to make it enjoyable as well as useful. So the Clean Up Australia, the Clean Up Coogee, blood donation, those sorts of things, um, I think, could uh, be, they'll be attractive to students, I think. What do, what do you think, AJ? Do you think those sorts of things might be doable? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, students has only one thing that they can't afford right now is that time. But other yeah. than that, they can, they can donate blood and other things and they yeah, and they could also go to the beach on a sunday some of them yeah yeah, who doesn't, Saturday, yeah, who yeah. and you know have fun and then meet people from all over the place yeah and cindy cindy's point i think is a very important one we we don't want chinese students or indian students or nepalese students just having a nepalese experience in australia they've already had that and it's fabulous but to for them to feel part of the wider community would be a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, you know, for shy people, it's, uh, you know, that's not natural. So, yeah, I think the, the broader we can make it and the more Australian we can make it, the better. Yeah. Uh, any any further questions, any other questions for Sai or, or AJ or anyone? Um, can I ask a question from yes, Sai? Please. Um, so I understand, like, you've been having um, some students from other places, you know, as a... Uh, volunteer work, you know, like workers there. So do they come from uh, like just uh, India or they come from Australia or, you know, other countries as well? But that's for you, Sai. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have uh, students, uh, youth is a big part of volunteering, right? Uh, we have uh, cells where from universities, some students in, uh, sign up to volunteer. And we have special festivals where we celebrate and we can put a roaster. And that's another time bound thing. And we also appreciate their time and give them certificates and um, it's open for all. So the general, the way it happens is, uh, for example, you are coming in, I'll just label you, you're from India, right? And then you bring along your friend who's from Korea and Sri Lanka with you. And three of you come and help us in one piece of work. You work together, but you also celebrate, enjoy the festival which is happening and be part of it, take some photos, take some, eat some nice food, and then you get a certificate of participation at the end and you, you've seen something culturally important with the multicultural Australia because the festivals are celebrated here and then all parts of, uh, all kinds of people come, right? It's open for all. So uh, that's something happens. Uh, universities, uh, people, uh, students come in groups and they're always multicultural groups, locals and mix of everyone, yeah. And, we and some, uh, sorry. So I was just going to ask, Dominic, have we got something for Dushura on, um, on Friday then? Oh, what's on Friday? Isn't it Dushura? It's a Gushara. What is it? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a festival. Uh, it's one of the big festivals in India, Dushara. Uh, it's, it's equally celebrated. Uh, uh, among all Hindus, so um, Nepalese celebrated big as well as as Indians, uh, Indians and Bangladeshi. So, yeah, it's, it's a big Hindu festival. From there, fortnight you get the Pavli, another big festival. So they are fortnight apart. D uh, Diwali, that's the festival of lights, is it? Correct. Yes. 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 That's the one I know of. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, okay. Um, well, and what sorts of things would the students be doing when they volunteer for these big events? That they'd be going to the temple, would they, for the festivals, or um, would they be doing other things? There are other things like we we want to celebrate in community, right? So they they could be doing emceeing, they could be helping us in um, event coordination, ticketing when people come in and go, and that kind of thing, information exchange physically helping us in setting up the stages and things like that. It all, it's the whole menu is open and we don't ask them for a particular thing. They can sign up saying, I want to be here or there or whatever they want to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, if somebody is, um, uh, some, some kids have helped us in managing the PA system, 
or running the slides and projectors and things like that, lighting, sound, all. As I said, like there's lots of things to learn. Sometimes, you know, they all have this passion. Some, uh, once I had a kid who came to Martin Place, it's a, we celebrate the Pavlin city and he wants to do photography. He took some photos for us and gave us the photos and he also took an extra, went an extra mile editing them and sending it back to us uh, on a drive. And so, yeah, you could be part of it in whichever way you want. We'll put all the options for you. Uh, well, in that light, uh, so I'd love to stay in contact. Well, I will stay in contact, but I'd love to, if you could send me events where you do require volunteers and I can yes. promote it with the students, I'd love to do that. Well, we would love to do that. So it would be lovely. Yeah. Things like photography and AV and stuff for our BIM students, really important. And some of them, you know, want to be photographers if they can get to events and do things rather yeah. than just taking pretty pictures. I think that gives them a feel for what it might be like in a business environment, perhaps working to a brief or something like that. Mm. That's right. AV is a big part. Like uh, if you see these people who are really running events, AV is the whole event, right? having a good <laughs> AV or not having a good AV ruins the whole event. Mm. And we, we, we are celebrating the Pavli in Parliament, New South Wales, right? Oh, really? If somebody wants to come, yeah, ah. on 9th of November. So if somebody wants to volunteer for that, they could Well, we, we, we have a, a small connection with Parliament, so we might progress that one too. <laughs> what are yeah. they doing in Parliament? Uh, the Pavli, celebrating the Pavli with the oh. parliamentarians, yeah. Dominic okay. should pick that one up. Yes. So when is it, Si? Uh, 9th of November. 9th of November. Okay. Are we do in multiple states. Uh, South Australia is doing that. Canberra Parliament is also doing that. We're celebrating there as well. So. Yeah, fabulous. 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 Oh, well, that's great, Si. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, Kerry, whether this is an appropriate time to move to your um, Engage project discussion. Well, I'll just talk about it for a few minutes, yeah. uh, Dominique, because um, unfortunately this is the last week of class so I could not encourage <laughs> my selfless, generous students to share what they're doing with yeah. us today. But, um, but, I'm, but I'm, I'm very thank you for the opportunity, Dominique, to be able to speak about this project because it's a project that's um, in, in, important to, to me. It's... Um, I think it is um, a worthwhile project. I know that students have enjoyed doing it immensely. And um, just for our guests' interest, um, the uh, in my class, um, I, the majority of my students, more than 50%, are from India. And the next group would be um, probably from the Philippines or Nepal, about equal numbers. And um, we started the subjects called employment regulation or regulation of work. And so we started the semester by talking about their personal experiences in work. And um, it was interesting for me to see how um, well developed and sophisticated their own personal analysis was they understood very well that most of them, not all, but most of them were operating in what we call the gig economy and that they were marginalised workers with very few protections. They understood that. And um, the combination of being a marginalised worker together with, unfortunately, the federal government's statement last year of, like, if you can't afford to be here, go home, actually um, had an effect on them and made them uh, be, I think, more analytical about what their rights were and such. And uh, so then we talked about our assessments and we decided that we would, um, each group would produce a pamphlet of information aimed to assist migrant workers um, who were new to the workforce. And it was very interesting to see the sort of issues that they saw as important. For example, something as basic as, um, are you an employee or a contractor? Are you entitled to 
sick leave or whatever. These sorts of things had not actually occurred to them. And many of the students had, in fact, been very happy to have jobs that they didn't pay tax in. They thought that was an advantage. But then they discovered when COVID hit that because they weren't paying tax, they also then couldn't get assistance. So it it did certainly, I mean, I think we will always look at this generation of migrants as a particular generation whose attitudes about work and about security and about tax and about the role of government was very much impacted by what happened to them during COVID. Because you could imagine how scary it would be to come to a new country, think you're doing okay, and next thing find that the government just says go home. Right. That was pretty that was pretty upsetting for them at that time. And I think it's left, unfortunately for Australia, I think it has left quite a bad feeling with a lot of our students. That feeling has been reduced a little bit in recent times because the government did step up and provide more assistance during the lockdown this year. But still, I think there is a little bit of uh, pain about in the in the in the minds of some of the students about how they were treated and there was certainly a very strong feeling that they should help other people to know what their rights are so interestingly even though the students i think would say oh no we're not really into volunteer volunteering they actually are but they're not seeing it as volunteering they're seeing it more as helping to spread the word and help people to understand their rights and stuff. So um, they're producing brochures on, as I said, things like, you know, are you an employee or a contractor? Uh, what's the difference between being permanent and or casual? Um, do I have any rights if I fall pregnant? These sorts of things. It's been quite interesting also for me to see what the students see as the most important rights and I know for a lot of Australians it would be like oh am I getting a pay increase this year um, how much do I get in superannuation but for these students it's much more basic you know can my boss just sack me if I get sick can I get some payment these sorts of things and um, <clears throat> I don't know how many people in the room know this but there used to be in Australia, in all of the major cities, um, offices funded by government, which were called working women's centres. And these working women's centres, there was a very famous one in the Blacktown area. It was somewhere where migrant women could go to find out about their entitlements in terms of sick leave, maternity leave, etc. And you might say, oh, well, why migrant women? Well, of course, many of you would know that women from some countries have some cultural difficulties going into a male-dominated environment to speak about their issues at work. But unfortunately, these working women's centres have been closed down around Australia. Now, I know there's one left in Darwin, and I only know that because it was on the ABC this week that it looks like losing its funding. And so the issue then becomes, well, where do, where does a migrant worker or a migrant woman worker go to get that assistance? And I would imagine, Sai, that there would be some members of the Hindu community who literally go to the Hindu council to try to get some advice about work. Would that be true? Yes, yes. We, we had a number of those cases last year and uh, what they were unwillingly or it wasn't intentional of them to go on cash and take it. Some somewhere didn't have a choice. They, they were given the work saying that only if you you'll be given work if you're working for cash. And for them, getting a job is more important than all these logistics. And they didn't know that they were getting into the trap of these things. So we heard many stories. And we, in, in the first few months, we had about over 700 um, inquiries. I'll send you a dashboard of what we've done. We did a survey as well at the end of this. 
um, with the students uh, whom we supported and uh, how whether their situation has improved or not. There's some good statistics which we collected uh, last year. And one of them was that there were lack of education and uh, somebody's doing it. So, okay, let me join you and work with you. And then they were trapped at the end. They could neither go, they were seen as illegal for doing what they were doing. And, and none of this was called for. So they were kind of stuck with us. Yeah. <laughs> So, I have, think that, so it just has echoes of the 7-Eleven stories from a yeah. few years ago, the Fair Work Ombudsman investigating 7-Eleven franchises for having the official payment record and then the unofficial record for you know, paying people for 20 hours and actually making them work 80 hours. Yeah, and it became a national scandal. They had um, mm. heard office claims that they knew nothing about it except that all the CCTVs went back centrally, so they, they had no defence. <laughs> oh, really? I'm sorry, because they've all got yeah. CCTV because they're dangerous places sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. of course, one of the things that, um, I mean, a primary question that uh, the students are asking, of course, is um, where do you go for this information? And in theory, at least, oh, there's government departments that you can go to. But, of course, I think we all know that they are not necessarily culturally appropriate. And if you are a migrant to a new country, you might have a number of reasons for being uncomfortable, in fact, going to a government body to find out about your rights, because maybe by accident you're going to say something that's going to get you into trouble. And, um, well, as I've said, we all know that in bygone decades there used to be government funded bodies like you know working working women's centers or my the migrant workers center of the western suburbs was pretty famous too now they've gone and i guess one of the questions for us dominic is going to be where do we advise people to go and just before i finish that i, I recognize that when i started at win you know seven eight years ago or whatever when I, when I started at WIN, um, there were already a whole list of services um, in the student handbook about where students could go to get assistance. But over the years, we've seen the defunding of so many of those. And so one by one, we've been removing them. And I think Eric would be aware of this too, where we've had to remove them from our students' handbook because the government no longer funds these outreach areas. So I guess maybe one of the things that we could do to thank you today, Sai, for being here, is to make sure that the Hindu Council of Australia is properly listed and recognised on or in all of our student advice, student handbooks, web page, etc., as um, a resource that students can utilise to get advice and assistance. Would that be a fair statement, Sai? Absolutely. We'd be privileged to be of any help to the students. Yeah. Okay, lo lovely. Uh, on, on that point too, I, I actually do have a, a perhaps a contact that is very useful. An organisation called Job Watch is funded as a community legal centre in Victoria, <laughs> Tasmania and Queensland, not in New South Wales. And their job is to provide advice to uh, people in relation to their employment rights. I know the CEO very well. Um, it'd be wonderful if we could, I could ask her about the, the, you know, the particular needs of international students and whether there's something that we could do to uh, build that up and make it more well known. Yeah. So, Dominic, I'm very conscious that we have people in the room who have to start teaching in five they do. minutes. They do. So I, I want to say thank you. Thank you very much, Sai, for being here today. And thank you to thank the you other Sai to facilitating um, this meeting. And um, I would love to be at a dinner party with both of you guys and see how that Sai Sai works out um, um, in conversation. Um, over a chicken korma. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Sai, for your generous uh, sharing of your time and your experience today. I was very touched by all the activities that the Hindu Council is doing. Um, I, yeah, I just I, I love this stuff. So thank you so much. We're going to stay in close contact. 
Um, thank you also for all the attendees, especially uh, Cindy and AJ. Um, AJ has been a wonderful new president for the uh, Students Association. And um, so thank you one and all. And um, we look forward onwards and upwards for Wentworth Engage and we will keep working away at, at solutions and ideas. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dominic. Um, before everyone goes, Thank can you. I say something, please? Yes, of course, Sajid. Yeah, yeah. So today we, we told Sarah to send email to all the teachers, and I've been talking to all the students, and we noticed that how hard you've been working, teachers going through, you know, like Zoom. Uh, it's something you you didn't you know you know learn in you know teaching a career, but it's just something that came upon you. And you guys have been doing great. And we just sent a message to you guys saying thank you for your hard work and, and teaching us, you know, like getting us through this time. Thank you, Ajay. That was very much Thanks, appreciated. Ajay. It's very yeah. classy yeah. of you. Yeah, yeah. so thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ajay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.